So look, let me, let me just, let me tell you all something just real quick right before we hop into the message. So the enemy is so mad, Jack. I'm telling you, he is so stinking angry because we are in a series titled The Most with the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. Because this is what he knows. The enemy knows this, church, that if we get to know the person of the Holy Spirit, we will begin to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll start operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, that, and he knows, man, when that starts to happen, when the church starts walking in the fullness of the Spirit of the living God, he is in big trouble. And so, boy, that enemy is so angry. And I got to admit, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's, it's amazing to me. But, but man, I'm telling you how, how I realize this is over the past several weeks, man, I've experienced uh, so much resistance, right, spiritually and physically. And when I talk about physically, obviously, I mean people, because how many of you know the enemy will use people? Yeah, come on. That's, that's what he does. But also, how many of you know this, that we don't fight against people. We don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, simply meaning this. Yeah, it might be people coming at us, but there's always an evil spirit behind it. It's just the way the Bible says it. And so it's, it's true. And so over the past several weeks, I've experienced all this, this resistance. And I tell you, at different times, I, I wanted to strike back like I was Luke Skywalker or something, right? Like, or like the kids would say it, I wanted to clap back, right? Like, you, you, you know, uh, but, but, but man, I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and, and, he, and he spoke this to me so clearly. He said, fight the right fight. Amen. Keith, fight the right fight. Don't get angry at people. Get angry with the enemy and get even with the enemy by rejoicing in trials of many kinds. Rejoice when the enemy is fighting against you because that means you're not fighting with him on the same team. Amen. Amen. And I tell you, after the Lord spoke that to me, I felt the presence of God come upon me. Man, I felt the Holy Spirit begin to encourage me. And immediately I start praying. I start praying in the Holy Ghost. Right then. And right then I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, now you're fighting the right fight. Now you're fighting the fight that will win it against the enemy. And, and look, the only reason I'm, I'm sharing that with you this morning is I really felt like someone needed to hear this uh, this morning. Because right now you're being attacked by the enemy. You're dealing with attacks. And maybe he's using your family. Maybe he's using your, your friends. What, whatever the case may be, the Lord wants you to be, to be reminded of, like he reminded me, fight the right fight and fight it the right way. Amen. Fight it the right way because it is the enemy fighting against you. It's the enemy coming against you. But, but here's what's beautiful. You can be encouraged because God has a breakthrough for you. It's right around the corner. I believe it with all my heart. It's right around the corner. And listen, all you have to do is not give up and not quit. You can just rejoice because knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. Rejoice because you are more than a conqueror. Rejoice because no weapon formed against you shall prosper in the mighty name of Jesus. Rejoice because if God be for you, nothing and no one can stand against you. See, we, church, as the people of God, we get to rejoice because we know that God will take everything that worthless devil meant for your harm, and he will use it for your good. And so we can rejoice. Someone shout rejoice. rejoice. We can rejoice. Man, we can rejoice in trials of many kinds. Here's why. Because God is working all things, all things. That's the good, the bad the ugly, the struggle, the hurt, the pain, the trauma. He's, he's working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's a promise. And so we get to, we get to rejoice. But I'm telling you, man, the enemy is so angry about this series. But who gives a flying leap? what he's angry about, we're going to still continue talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. And, and the reason we're going to keep talking about him, here's why. When we talk about him, he shows up. And the reason he shows up is because he knows he's welcome to do what he wants to do in the people and through the people. When we begin to invite him and, and desire to have him move in our, our, our lives. And so, man, we're going to keep talking about it. Amen. Amen. So let's get into week number five of the series, again, that we've titled the most 
with the Holy Ghost. And look, the, the reason that we, we've, we've titled it that is simply because Jesus says he is to your advantage. The Holy Spirit's your advantage. It's to your advantage that I go so that I can send you the person of the Holy Spirit. And the reason Jesus is saying this is because he knows that when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we know the Holy Spirit, we will have the most. We'll have the most. We'll have the most wisdom. We'll have the most revelation. We'll have the most understanding. We'll have the most anointing. We'll have the most authority. We'll have the most power. We'll have the most fire. Better said, we will have the fire power of God through the person of the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. We'll have the fire power of God. See, see, Jesus knows that the Holy Ghost is the most important person for us to know on the earth. So he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. It's to your advantage. See, Jesus, this is what he knew. He knew that the Holy Ghost was going to be the only person of the Godhead left on the earth. He was going to be the only one left here. See, Jesus knew he was about to ascend into the heavens and be seated at the right hand of God the Father forevermore above all thrones and dominions and powers and positions. He was going to be seated at God's right hand forevermore. And he knew that the Father was going to remain on his heavenly throne as the earth, as his footstool. So he says, it's to your advantage that I go ahead and go away. Because Jesus understood this. The Holy Spirit could be everywhere for everybody all the time. Everywhere for everybody at all times. See, 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 Jesus knew this, that while he was on the earth, hear me, th this is what he knew. While he was on the earth, he could only be one place at one time. He was very limited in his earthly body. He was very limited by it. He could only minister to the people that was where he was at the time he was there while he was on the earth. Uh, think about this, this for a moment. Because I think we actually overlook this at times when we read it. Like, what do you mean to your advantage that I go away? Jesus, it's amazing. You're amazing. And he is all that. But, but think about this. If Jesus would not have left the earth, okay? And if we wanted to, to receive a touch from God or a word from God, you know what we'd have to do? We'd have to hop our happy butts on an airplane and fly to Tel Aviv, okay? Or we'd have to hop on a ship, sail across the sea, get to Israel. Then when we got to Israel, we'd have to try to track him down, wherever he was in Israel at the time in the Middle East. We, we would have to try to track him down. I don't think it would have been that hard because massive crowds followed him wherever he goes, right? So we would find him, but once we found him, guess what? We'd have to wait weeks, if not months, if not even maybe years just to get near him to receive prayer or to receive a word from God. And to be honest, he knew that most of us don't have the patience for none of that. Most of us can't even sit in a BK drive through for 15 minutes and wait for our food, me included. Amen. I've actually had to call him before. Like, what are you doing in there? <laughs> you got me out here waiting. I got stuff to do. It's terrible. I don't even like to admit it. I had to repent. <laughs> I did. I'm confessing my sins to one another so that I might be saved. <laughs> my body might be healed. But for real, we, we don't have the patience for that, to even sit for 15 minutes and wait for a meal, let alone stand in a prayer line for months upon months upon months just to get near Jesus. So Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away because the Holy Spirit will be with you always. And he says, even till the end of the age, he's gonna be everywhere with you all the time. And let me tell you why that's, to our advantage. Here's why. Because the Holy Spirit is God. He's, he's God. That, that's who he is. He's not the lesser portion of the Godhead. He's not. He's God, equal, equal in power, equal in might as the Father and the Son. He, he, he's God. And so that means this. It's our advantage that Jesus went because now God himself, the same spirit that rose Christ from the grave, now lives in us, is now is for us. It's absolutely amazing. He's available for us. I, I tell you, I, I really thought we were gonna talk about the, the power of the Holy Spirit today, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and walk through all of those, and we will eventually get there. Uh, but I gotta admit, as I was studying for that message, right? And, and look, I've preached on the gifts of the Holy Spirit multiple different times, so I got notebooks after notebooks on it. And so I'm going back, and I'm trying to study and, and receive this word from the Lord, right? And I'm telling you, man, I couldn't get anything 
And I was like, what is happening? I mean, I could pull one from the archives and just preach it, Bob. You know what I mean? Like just, hey, just do, you know, control, all, you know, copy, paste, whatever. But I don't like to do that. And so I was praying. I was like, Lord, I need a fresh word. Like, like how do I present this to, to, to this body of believers at this time in their life? Because how many of you know, I need a rhema word. I need a fresh word from God. I don't need something regurgitated to me. I need a word from the living God. And so I'm praying, but I had zero peace about it. And after I fought and toiled over it for a couple of days, finally, I, I surrendered. And I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to preach? Since you know better than me, which he does. But God, what would you have me preach? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to talk and say to your people? What do you want? And he spoke to me just one word at the beginning. He said to me, intimacy. I want you to talk about intimacy. And then I said, we just talked about that, Lord, last week. And then the Lord, so clearly and very abruptly, he said, it wasn't enough. (laughs) It wasn't enough. You need to talk about intimacy. And right after that, the Lord, you know, I guess made me understand the gravity of what he was trying to get across to me. He reminded me of Matthew chapter seven, starting in verse 21, because this is a warning from the Lord. I mean, God is shooting off warning shots and we'll just go ahead and read it. And this is Jesus, by the way, speaking. He says this, not everyone who says to me on that day, talking about the day of judgment, Not everyone who says to me on that day, Lord, 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 will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. He says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do powerful works in your name? And then I'll say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. Well, wait a minute, Lord. Didn't they say, Lord, Lord? Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of that even matters. I never, I never knew you. See, what what Jesus is saying here, he's saying on the day of judgment, look, when it's all decided, when it's all decided, grace has left the earth. Now judgment has come to the earth through the person of Jesus Christ. When it's decided on who's getting into the kingdom of heaven to live eternally with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or the people who are going to get sent to hell, where the Bible says the worm, the worm never stops eating and the fire never stops burning. That's what it says. And there'll be wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever and ever. That's on that day. This is the day he's talking about. On that day when this will be decided who gets into the kingdom, he's saying this. He's saying it will be intimacy over activity. It'll be intimacy over activity. Jesus says on that day, many people will think just because they operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, that that means they automatically know the person of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is like, oh, no, 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 no. That isn't true. That isn't true at all. In other words, Jesus is is making it very clear to us. It's, It's way more important for us to know the person of the Holy Spirit before knowing and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what he's saying. Because it will always be intimacy over activity. Because Jesus knows this very, very clearly. He knows that if if we have intimacy with the Holy Spirit, we will automatically start to operate in this powerful activity of the Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 14. Again, this is what it says. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship, someone shout fellowship, Fellowship. and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Be with you all. And look, remember the Greek word that, that's used there for fellowship, right? It's koinonia. Last week I had to use my app to tell you the thing, but I've had a revelation on how to say it this week. Koinonia, okay? Koinonia. And again, we talked about this a little bit last week, but what it means is, is this, to have communion with right, to have a close relationship with, to have proof of a brotherly unity with, to have social intercourse with, this is literally what the the word means, and last but not least, 
to have intimacy, to have intimacy with. So, so Paul right here is, is saying very, very simply to us, it's great to have the grace of Jesus Christ. How many of you are so grateful for God's grace? I know I am. I know I am. I need it every day. It's great to have the grace of Jesus Christ. It's awesome, right, to know that God the Father loves you. It's absolutely amazing. However, he's like, but you also need to realize that you've got to have fellowship with the person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, you have to have intimacy with the person of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about very three basic things, how we develop a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, right? We talked about three things. One was spending time in the Word of God. Hear me. When we spend time in the Word of God, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Now we're hearing from Him because we are in the Word of God. And so that's one way. The other way was what? To talk to Him. To talk to Him. Right? Out loud. Holy Spirit, I honor you. Holy Spirit, I love you. I desire you, Holy Spirit. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me, Holy Spirit. It's a constant dialogue with you and the Holy Spirit, inviting him into your life and revealing things to you. And then remember, we talked about how we can't always talk out loud, right? So, so what do we do? We talk in our hearts because he knows the deepest parts of our hearts anyway. He knows our thoughts. So we talk to him in our heart because Paul says, pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. But in order to never stop praying and still not look crazy to everybody around us, we better learn how to pray in our hearts. We better learn how to do that. We pray in our hearts. Why? So we fix the eyes of our hearts on the person of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't know who he is, then we ask him, reveal yourself to me, Holy Spirit. Teach me who you are who you are. And then we talked about how we have to live a lifestyle of repentance because repentance is obedience. Repentance is so important because a righteous man falls seven times, but every time he gets right back up, that we all fall short of the glory of God, right? So we got to live this lifestyle of repentance. These are the ways that we talked about last week on how we develop a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. But the Lord wanted to take us deeper today and what that looks like so that we can learn how to have intimate fellowship, not just fellowship. Are you with me? Like, not just, hey, what's up, bro? You know what I mean? Like, how you doing good, right? Like, not to just know about the Holy Spirit, but to know him personally. And, and there's, a, there's a big difference between intimate fellowship and just fellowship. Hey, hear me, I have a lot of fellowship with a lot of people every single day of my life, right? It's a lot. But do you know there's only... <laughs> really one person that I have intimate fellowship with on this earth, and her name is Mrs. Deal, okay? In case you're wondering, right? Like, in case that went over your head. Her name is Julie Deal, right? Like, and I don't talk to her like she's my boy. Like, what's up? You know what I mean, how you doing? I don't, I don't talk to her like that, giving her a high five. No, no, I, I talk to her like I desire her. I talk to her like I respect her. I talk to her like I honor her and I adore her. That's the way I talk to her. And, and this is what the Lord is, is trying to reveal to us today. We need to talk to the Holy Spirit like we desire the Holy Spirit, like we honor the Holy Spirit. We, we are to live a life worthy of the call, worthy for the Holy Spirit to say, yeah, 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 he's mine, she's mine. They're mine. They're mine. This is what the Lord wants us to take away from today. Intimacy creates availability. Hear me. Intimacy creates availability. Let me, let me try to explain it this way to you. So there are certain days, certain times in a day that, that no one can get a hold of me. Nobody. Nobody can get a hold of me at all. Not my boys, not my friends, and no offense to any of them. And no offense to any of you, like there are certain days, certain times of a certain day that no one can get a hold of me at all. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not reachable at all. I'm unavailable. But there's one exception to that rule, just one. And it doesn't matter what day it is, don't matter what time of day it is. If, if my wife calls me or texts me, I make sure I'm available for her. I make sure of it. I mean, she can literally text me any time of the day on any day, and say, hey, honey, can you do X, Y, Z? Yes, I can, babe. I'll do it right now. I'll take care of it. Because I want to make sure she knows I'm available for her at any time, any place, no matter the request. 
That's what I wanted to know. Shoot, when I'm, when I'm in a meeting, right, and my phone rings, okay, many of you have been in meetings with me, and, and my phone rings, and I see it's my wife, I always say, hey, give me just a second here. I gotta, ta- I gotta take this. I gotta take this. Why? Because I wanna be available for her. But if I'm in a meeting with you and my phone rings, which it does 100 times in every meeting, if it rings and it's not my wife, I'm unavailable for them because I'm available for you. I will not answer it. I will not pick it up. I will not shoot a text back. I I leave that thing alone because me and you are meeting. I'm available. But see, my wife, it's a whole different story. Because here's why. Intimacy creates availability. Availability comes from having incredible intimacy with an individual, right? Right? And this is the type of intimacy the Holy Spirit desires to have with you and me. It's that type of intimacy where we're always available for him. The type of intimacy that would cause us to be wherever, whenever, however, whatever he says, we're available. No matter the time of day, no matter what it is, Lord, you request it, I give it because I'm available to you. And in order for us to be that available for the Holy Spirit, we have to be intimate with him. It's the only way to do it. We can't just know about him. We have to to know him. But see, what I, I find that's so difficult for us, right, to live this this type of way, this intimate life with the Holy Spirit. Here's why. Because we're too intimate with our flesh. That's just the truth. We're way too intimate with the flesh, making us way too available to the flesh. This is why so many people in the church struggle with certain sin in their life. It's true because they're too intimate with the flesh. This is why you have 68% of men in the body of Christ, 68% of men in the body of Christ who struggle with a pornography addiction. 50% of pastors that stand behind the pulpit today in America, 50% of them struggle with porn addiction. 33% of women in the church struggle with pornography. Why, Why is that? Because they're way too intimate with the flesh, and so they're way too available for the flesh. And and, and here's here's the, the reality. We can't be intimate with the flesh and intimate with the Holy Spirit church. Can't have both, which is why Paul makes this statement. He says, be led by the spirit so that you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. What's he saying? He's saying, be so intimate with the person of the Holy Spirit, so in love, so drawn to him that you will not be intimate and available for the flesh. Or, or another, another way to say that would be this, be intimate with the Holy Spirit so that the flesh has no place to pull you has no ability to create an availability in your life because you're so close with the person of the Holy Spirit. And here's why. Because your flesh will lead to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, leads to death. But the Spirit leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. So this is the options that we have. You know, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, light has no fellowship Light has no fellowship with darkness at all. Guess what the word for fellowship is there in the Greek? Koinonia. The same exact word that he uses in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. In other words, he's saying, look, if you have intimate relationship with your flesh, you have no intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. And so now you're too available to the flesh so that the flesh can pull you in the directions it desires to pull you. See, we can't have intimacy, church, with the Holy Spirit and with our flesh. We can't have both. This is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and expect to get in the kingdom of heaven. They ain't coming in. They were too intimate with the flesh. They, they, were, they were too drawn and available for their flesh to take them on whatever road the flesh desired to take them on. They won't get in. Only the people who do my father's will will get in. This is why he also says in Matthew, he says this. He says, you can't serve two masters. Can't serve two. You'll love the one and you'll hate the other. 
So, so, so you can't be intimate with your flesh and intimate with the Holy Spirit. James says this, if you have fellowship with the world, you are an enemy of God. Holy rip. You're an enemy of God. And why is that? It goes on. It says, because the spirit of God yearns jealously for intimacy with you. And he can't have, you can't have both. Can't have intimacy with the flesh and intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And if we try to do that, it leads to lukewarm Christianity. This is why the churches in America are filled with lukewarm Christianity. Because so many people are intimate with their flesh, which is why religion has such a pull on people because it's all about your ability in the flesh to follow something God has desired you to follow instead of a personal, intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit that is empowering you and strengthening you and causing you to walk upright in his statutes, just like Ezekiel says. See, because so many people have intimacy with their, their flesh, they're friends with the world. They're fl- friends with the world. And, and because they're friends with the world, what happens? I'll tell you what happens. So they, they go to the bar on Friday night, the bar on Saturday night. Come on, I'm preaching today. I'm preaching a whole lot better than you're saying too. <laughs> they go to the bar on Friday night, the bar on Saturday night, and then come to church on Sunday morning. This is just where it's at, okay? This is what the Lord's telling me to speak to you. Don't get mad at me. I'm the messenger. This, this is what they do. And then they go to church on Sunday like, oh yeah, I'm good. No, no you're not good, <laughs> You're not good because you're not having intimacy with the Holy Spirit. You have an intimacy with your flesh. This is why people Monday through Saturday talk to their spouses like dogs, treat their kids real terribly, but then come into church on Sunday lifting their hands. Praise God. This is, this is how, how we live. This is why people listen to secular music that glorifies sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay, Watch movies that they shouldn't be watching. They put their careers and their hobbies above seeking an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. This leads to lukewarm Christianity, which then leads to being a friend of the world and an enemy to God. All those things and things like those, hear me, and things like those can only lead to one thing. That's intimacy with the flesh. It has no other option in your life. None. None. And Jesus said those types of people, this is what he says. I'll spew them out of my mouth. I'll spew them. They're not allowed near me. I don't know about you, but that scares me. That creates a holy fear in my life to say, Lord, help me to not be intimate with my flesh and intimate with you. See, we've got to be on fire for God. We've got to be on fire for him to live for him. There is no one leg in and one leg out. I'm not saying we all are in different places in our life. And whatever place we're at, we got to be fully in. I'm not saying there ain't things as you're walking with the Lord that the Lord is cutting off of you. Sure there is. But at this moment, you're fully into him. Whatever he asks, you're willing to give. This is what the Lord wants us to realize. This is how we develop intimacy with the person of the Holy Spirit. See, we've got to stop playing church in the church. Come on. We got to knock that crap off. And the only way we do that is by having an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit that causes us to be available to the Holy Spirit. Two weeks ago, we, we talked about how we need to stay the most ready for the return of Christ. Hear me, Jesus is coming back. I'm telling you, he is coming back and it's closer than any of us want to think about and any of us want to admit, but he is coming back soon. And he's coming for a bride, one without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Not a bunch of lukewarm Christians who are playing church. He's coming back. Why? Because the end is drawing near. Listen to me. The end is drawing near. Jesus literally said this. You'll know that the signs of the end times is upon you. When right will become wrong and wrong will become right. When men will fall to their their fleshly desires and love other men. When women will fall to their fleshly desires and love other women. The society will swallow a camel but they'll choke on a gnat. Isn't that exactly what we're seeing in our society today? It's just what we're seeing. Telling us the end is so so near. So we've got to stay the most ready for Christ's return. And in order for us to stay the most ready, we got to stay on fire for Jesus. And we do that by being intimate with the Holy Spirit. And see, the reason so many in the church have intimacy with our flesh and not with the Holy Spirit, here's why. 
because we haven't surrendered fully to the person of the Holy Spirit. We haven't surrendered fully to the person of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we may have surrendered some things to the Holy Spirit, certain things, things that we're, we're glad to surrender. We're okay with surrendering, right? Things like addiction. We're like, yeah, please, I surrender that nonsense. I don't want none of that. Lord, you can have it. I don't want it. Things like depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts. And we should surrender all that. I'm not saying we should. I'm, we should. But, but here's what I'm trying to say. Where the rubber meets the road is when the Holy Spirit asks you to surrender something you want and you like. That's when the rubber meets the road. That's going to speak to the intimacy that you share with him. How much availability does he have to speak in your life and say, give me that, that, and that. And you love this, that, and that. This is why, this is why so many people in the church have a real struggle with tithing to the church. They have a real struggle. I mean, less than 10% of the church actually tithes the way God says to tithe, right? Why? Because we, we like we like our money. We want our money, right? We, we, we like it. And so, you know, when God says give, we're cool to give to certain things and things that we like and things that we agree with or whatever, right? Outreaches and all that stuff. Cool. But when God says, no, 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 give me a tenth, 10%, not $10, not 100, 10% of whatever it is, income, which by the way, tithing is not of time. Tithing is your finances. It's literally what it means a financial tithe, giving 10%. But when God asks us for 10%, we're like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. That's a little bit much. Like that's a little extreme, Lord. But yet the scripture says, the Holy Spirit's like, bring your whole tithe into the storehouse so that there'll be food in my house. In other words, he's saying, bring your whole tithe into the church so that the church can do the work of the ministry. That's what it's saying. So, so bring the whole 10%. What does that mean? That means that you make a thousand bucks a week, you give a hundred bucks a week. That's all I mean. Pretty simple. But bring a, bring a tenth. And not just give what we've decided in our hearts to give. Because this is what we do, right? We, we'll sit down with our paper and our pen and we'll get out the Excel spreadsheet and we'll see our budget. Well, the budget. The budget's this. I gotta write my bills out first. And then, well, you know, I'm gonna set aside. I want a new TV. So I got, you know what I'm saying? I gotta set this aside for that. I need the NFL Sunday ticket. I gotta, you know, I gotta set aside for that. And then we give to the Lord what we feel comfortable giving without us having to give up anything. Because we, we like our Starbucks coffees and lattes and all, all that other. We like going out to dinner five times a week. We like to do what we wanna do when we wanna do it. It's just that simple. I do too, by the way. But, but, but where the rubber meets the road is, but, but what's God asking you to surrender? What's the Holy Spirit requiring of you in order for you to be fully surrendered to him in every aspect of your life? Because this is what God is asking of us if we want to have intimacy with the Holy Ghost. To give him and to surrender to him anything he asks for. Anything and everything he asks for. And intimacy will create availability. Availability on our end and availability on his end. Hear me. I was thinking about the story of Abraham and I'm almost done. Worship team, if you guys could come. The story of Abraham is absolutely amazing, right? I was thinking about how he's called the father of our faith, how, he, how he's called a friend of God, right? And I started to think about the story in Genesis chapter 18. So in that chapter, right, it, it's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's about to destroy it because of the way they live their life. How they're so intimate with their flesh and not intimate with the Holy Spirit. And so God's about to destroy it. But what I find amazing about that is, is that God goes and talks to Abraham about it before he does it. Think about that. The God of the universe knows what he's got to do but he goes and talks to Abraham. Why? Because Abraham and God were so intimate with one another. And I love it. And so he goes and tells Abraham, hey, listen, I'm about ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm gonna wipe it out. And Abraham's response is, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, God, hold up. Like, what if, what if I can find 50 righteous people in the land? Will you spare it? God says, yeah, because you asked me to spare it, Abraham. If you find me 50, I'll spare it. Abraham knew he wasn't going to find 50. He knew it. 
Okay, Lord, how about, how about 45? If I can find 45 people, will you spare it? God's like, yeah, actually, because you asked me for it, Abraham, I'll spare it for you. Abraham, knowing there ain't even 45 people. So he says, how about 40? God, God, what if I can just find 40 people who are righteous? Will you then spare the entire land? God, yep, yeah, because you asked me. And then he goes down, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, clear down to 10 people. God, please don't be angry with me. This is what he says. Don't be angry, God, and destroy me. Don't be angry, but if I can find just 10, will you spare it then? He says, yeah, Abraham, I'll do it for you. I'll do it. I'll spare the entire, the entire, both the cities. I'll, I'll spare it all if you find me just 10 righteous. I find that to be so amazing that here you have this man having a straight up conversation with the God of the universe. And the God of the universe listened to what he said. Was going to do exactly what he asked him to do. Was going to change his mind towards something he had already said in his heart to do. But see, this is what we've got to realize in this story. Years prior, way, way back, way before Genesis 18, we had a different exchange between Abraham and God. And God says to Abraham this. He says... I need you to leave everything. You got to leave everything, everything you love, everything you've built, everything that you desire, everything that you're comfortable with. You got to leave it all and go follow me. And guess what happens? Abraham does it. Okay, God. God's saying, Abraham, I need you to fully surrender everything to me. And because Abraham did it, this is what developed this incredible relationship, this intimate relationship with the God of heaven and earth. He had an intimacy that created availability. Abraham was available for God, but God was also available for Abraham. See, if we have an intimacy with the Holy Spirit, it's because we have surrendered whatever the Holy Spirit has asked us to surrender, whatever that is. And, and we're going to have to surrender, hear me. We're going to have to surrender everything. We're going to have to surrender what we like, what we want, what we love. We're going to have to surrender our hearts, our dreams, our ambitions, our desires, our talents. we got to surrender our ears and our eyes and our, even our mouths to the Holy Spirit. Proving that we're available for the Holy Spirit, then He'll prove He's available for us. This is, this is how it works. This is how it works. If we desire an intimacy with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, it comes from a place of surrender. Surrender creates intimacy. You can't have one without the other church. I'm sorry. That's the cost if you really want to follow Christ. This is why Jesus says, count the cost before you come follow me because there's a great cost to your life. And it's everything you desire in life. Set it all aside. Give it all up to come after me. Acts chapter 20. There's this incredible exchange. Because what we see through the entire book of Acts is these men hearing the Holy Spirit speak to them and them doing exactly what the Holy Spirit asked of them. And in Acts chapter 20, it says that Paul was going and preaching and teaching throughout the land. And he was on his way to Asia Minor to preach the gospel. He thought that's where he was headed. But before he got there, he prayed and the Holy Spirit said, I forbid you to go there. So he couldn't go into the land. I love that. The Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going there to preach the gospel. I told you no. Paul doesn't do it. Acts chapter 13, we see a similar situation. But in this, this situation, the Holy Spirit speaks to the whole church at Antioch, the entire church, and says, I want you to anoint Paul and Barnabas to send them out to preach the gospel. The church gets up, lays their hands on Paul and Barnabas, sends them out. Right after that, it says that the Holy Spirit then spoke to Paul and Barnabas and showed them every city and every town they were supposed to go and minister to. They could hear the Holy Spirit speak because they were so intimate with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter eight, probably my, my, my favorite story in the whole thing. Because it's a story about Philip. Philip is this awesome man of God. 
And the Holy Spirit speaks to Philip and says, go to Samaria and preach the gospel. So he does, he goes and he's having this massive gospel crusade, massive, thousands of people there, thousands of people. They're getting saved, they're getting healed. People are getting up out of wheelchairs, getting up off of their mats, like crazy encounters. Thousands of people were being set free from demonic influences in their lives, getting filled with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this gospel crusade, the Bible says that a voice of the angel came and said to Philip, Philip, go to the desert. He leaves this gospel crusade to go in the middle of a desert, doesn't have any clue what he's doing out there. But the Bible then says, I love this, the Bible then says, when Philip arrived in the desert, the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip. And the Holy Spirit told him, go and minister to this chariot. What was in the chariot was this man of God, right? This man who ends up being a man of God, who is one of the most powerful men in all of Ethiopia, okay? He gets saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized, all this cool stuff. But, but here, here's what I love about that story. Philip was so close to the Holy Spirit that he could tell the difference between the voice of an angel and the voice of the Holy Spirit. Because it's specific in the word of God. The angel said, go to the desert, but the Holy Spirit said, go to the chariot. He could tell the difference between the voice of an angel and the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know how many people come to me and say to me, you know, pastor, I'm having a really hard time knowing the difference between my own thoughts and the Holy Spirit or even the Holy Spirit and the enemy. I'm not sure, I'm having a hard time deciphering, telling the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit and some, some other voice. You know what I tell them? I say, well, then you need to surrender your ears to the Holy Spirit. You gotta surrender your time. You gotta be, you gotta be in your word. You wanna know his voice, first of all. You gotta, be, you, gotta be, you gotta be in his word. And then you gotta ask him, teach me your voice, Lord. Ask him to teach you his voice. Let me explain it like this. So I could be in a room full of people, right? And not even see my wife, but her yell something like, hey, babe. And I know it's her. I'll turn right around. It could be a hundred other people saying my name, whatever. Don't matter. I know her voice. I'll be standing in Walmart. I've had this happen quite a few times. And she could be five or six aisles away. I can't see her. There's all kinds of people in there. And I hear her yell, hey, honey. And I'm like, yep, that's, that's my wife yelling at me again. Praise God. She does it often. But pray for it. No, I'm just kidding. But I can hear her. I'm like, I can't see her, but I can hear her. And I know it's her. I can pick up the phone at the church office and it'd be any number of women on the phone. And I don't confuse them with my wife's voice. I'm not like, hmm, is this Julie or is this... Uh... No, oh, that, that's my wife. Or no, that's not my wife. Why? Because I can tell the difference between her voice and any other voice. Why? Because I have an intimate relationship with my wife. I've spent time talking with her, listening to her, knowing her, developing this closeness with her. So I know her voice really well. Listen to me. We can get to the place in this life now where we know the Holy Spirit's voice that well. We can know his voice that well, where we can tell the difference between our own thoughts and his voice, between his voice and the voice of an angel. We can tell the difference, I'm telling you. But it comes from a place of intimacy. It's an intimacy that will create availability. But it all has to come from surrender. That's where it starts. It starts with, are you willing to surrender whatever it is that the Holy Spirit's asking you for? Why don't you go ahead and stand to your feet, please. Matthew chapter seven, bringing this back up again. Jesus makes this statement, no one will get into the, into the kingdom unless they do the will of my father. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away so that I can send you to help her. He says, it's the Holy Spirit that will teach you all things. It's the Holy Spirit that will reveal the will, will of the Father. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't even know the will of the Father. So what Jesus is saying is you've got to have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. Know the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about being able to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, I'm more I'm talking about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Hear me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, meekness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. But we've got to have those things to prove we have the Holy Spirit, to be intimate with the Holy Spirit in order to know God's will. Because on that day, many will say to him, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all this? And he'll say, depart from me, you 
work of iniquity. He'll say, I have desired intimacy over activity from the beginning of time. And it's the same today. Come on, bow your heads. Close your eyes. Yeah, Father. I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that, Lord, as we open these altars, Lord, I pray that we would come this morning and surrender to you in a more full way. God, that today we would take that next step to say, Holy Spirit, I want to know your voice. Holy Spirit, I surrender it all so that I can know you better, so that I can have an intimate relationship with you from this point forward. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be here as people come. The Holy Spirit, you would encounter them just like Lainey talked about, God, how you encountered her, which caused her to even lay down more of her life to you. I pray that would be all of our testimonies right here today, that we would encounter you and surrender it all to you. Holy Spirit, have your way in Jesus' mighty name. So look, church, the worship team's gonna sing. I really feel like we need to open the altars for us to come and say, Lord, reveal to me what you want me to lay down. And I'm believing that God's gonna empower us today to walk in a, in a fuller way of surrender from this day forward. Amen. Amen. Come on. Dear yeah, Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit today. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you've decided to make your dwelling place in us. So I pray today, Lord, that you would help us, strengthen us, impart to us the ability to have intimacy with you. Teach us that, Holy Spirit. I pray you would put such a desire and a hunger in our hearts today, Lord, to know you more deeply, Lord. But we pray for the intimacy that creates availability, that we would be so available for you, desiring you, wanting to be used by you, I pray that, Lord, and Lord, each and every person today, God, came and laid things down before you. I pray you would strengthen them to never pick it up. What they have surrendered today, we declare in Jesus' mighty name, would no longer have a hold on them, would no longer be able to steer them or pull them. We declare that in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us today would take another step closer with you and away from having intimacy with our flesh, that we would no longer be available to the flesh. I pray that. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you, God, that you yearn jealously to have intimacy with them. Reveal that to us today in a greater way.